Uh, with that, let's turn to our first speaker, which is our wonderful OFS chair, Sir Michael Barber. Uh, we are delighted to hear from Michael this morning, and with this, I hand over to him. Um, well, first of all, thank, thank you all for coming. I, I, um, I woke up this morning and looked out and saw the snow all over London. I thought maybe uh, Nicola and I would be standing alone in the QE2 centre um, hearing reports on trains that weren't getting into London. So we're really uh, delighted on a, a, a challenging for travel. So thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm basically here as the warm-up act for Shakira Martin, who is uh, on in a few minutes. I'm looking forward to introducing... Um, we have tried to be very clear over the last few months in the uh, OFS, uh, in the board, uh, with, with Nicola and myself, uh, about what our priorities are. And there's a world of activity, a lot of attention on higher education in the media. It's at the centre of uh, a lot of the political debate about uh, the future of Britain. Uh, and that's a big advantage in lots of ways for, for all of us who... Uh, believe in uh, and love the higher education sector and see its importance for the country. Um, but in the world of activity, one story after another, it's really important for us to have a clear, disciplined, rigorous focus on our priorities. And I just want to set those out very quickly. The regulatory framework, which is being published today, there's a session on that early this afternoon. Equality of opportunity, access, progression through university, progression into the labour market, equity in all of that really important priority, building on the work that Les and others have done at Offer, uh, made some really good progress. Many of you have contributed. We want to go further. Uh, and Chris will be leading on that. And again, we have a session on that. Uh, quality of teaching, uh, not, just, not just the TEF, but, but the TEF and all that goes with it. Uh, that's what students continuously tell us is their top priority. We have a session on that today. Employability in the 21st century. What's it going to look like? What kind of skills do you need to be employable, uh, to be successful in the labour market uh, that lies ahead? Again, we have a session on that uh, during the day. And then, um, finally, value for money, informed choice, making good decisions. Uh, and uh, we will bring through all of that the student perspective to bear, not just the current generation of students, but students in 5 and 10 and 15 years what will they think? What will they want? What will they need? Uh, I don't want to spend time, though, in my uh, 15 minutes now talking about each of those priorities because they're going to be played out in the sessions that I've described, some of which are interactive. We look forward to engaging with you on all of that. What I want to do is take a step back from that and try and uh, give an impression of how we as an OFS will approach our priorities, will approach our work, will approach our relationships with all of you uh, and many people beyond this room. Uh, and uh, I want to start by bringing, I'm going to bring several perspectives to bear. Um, and uh, I've got a slide for each of them. And the first one is the perspective of history. This is H.A.L. Fisher. He was, 100 years ago, he was the president of the Board of Education. He introduced uh, and took through Parliament the 1918 Education Act, uh, which was a quite far-sighted piece of legislation. He was the vice chancellor of Sheffield, University before he became uh, president of the Board of Education, and then in Parliament he represented Sheffield Hallam University. Uh, the reason I've got him on this slide now is he developed, along with the Treasury, what became the University Grants Committee, which in my view is the beginning of having a university system in England. We had universities before that, but a university system, uh, you, can, you can choose your date, but I, I date it from the creation of the University Grants Committee uh, he went on to uh, be the head of New College and to write a history of Europe, which in my distant youth I read and enjoyed. Um, so, in, in a way, he was the founder of the system. But I see the foundation of the OFS in the context of the UGC back then, the Robbins Report in 1963, the 1992 legislation that created HEFKE, uh, and we, we all know of HEFKE's important contribution over the last 25 years, the 2004 legislation that created uh, Offer and its important contribution, and then the 2017 legislation, which we're building on with our regulatory framework published today. So one thing we will do is bring the perspective of history to bear. 
The second perspective uh, is the perspective of the future. You can spend your whole time in public policy, we all know this, responding to the latest uh, story in the media, the latest crisis, the latest thing that's gone wrong somewhere in the system. And we will, of course, deal with the day-to-day -day, uh, as we uh, uh, go through what we have to do. Uh, so those opportunities and challenges we'll respond to as we have to. But we'll always do it, or always try to do it, with a view on the long-term perspective, where we're going. Just as Hefke's uh, made a contribution over a 25-year period, or the Robbins Review from 1963 through to the late 70s was enormously influential. So we need to think 5, 10, 20, 25 years out. And that perspective of the long road ahead, this is the road to Arran Island in Scotland, that's the kind of perspective we want to bring to this. Uh, so we will be thinking about the next generation even as we respond to the day-to-day. -day. Because we can't manage a system, but we can create the conditions in which uh, the higher education system and individual institutions can thrive and grow and innovate. Which leads to the third perspective, which is the perspective of diversity. Uh, General de Gaulle struggled, as we know from this famous quotation, to run, to, to govern France. How can anybody govern a, a country with 246 types of cheese, he said. Well, we don't have to govern a higher education system. We'd like lots of types of cheese. 246 is just a start, as far as we're concerned. We want to see diversity. We want to encourage diversity. We want a whole variety of different providers of higher education to thrive. We want innovation from within the existing sector and from new providers. So we'll bring a perspective of diversity to everything uh, that we do. And that diversity, by the way, doesn't just apply to institutions. It also applies to students, international and national, young and old, uh, all different ethnic uh, backgrounds, uh, different genders, whatever it might be. We want diversity and we want to see a system that provides, offers diversity and change over time. And I must say in my visits to universities over the last year, which have been a complete joy, seeing, for example, how Salford is building relationships with business, how Brunel is developing a future in which we'd never need to mine aluminium because we can keep recycling it, how Birkbeck is providing for adults, how the Royal College of Music is developing entrepreneurship, how Leeds has redesigned its library so beautifully, how Nottingham Trent is doing a fantastic job on employability. I could go on. These are fantastic innovations happening within the system. And then uh, there's the new universities that are coming in, like the Dyson Institute in Malmesbury. I love the fact that it's in the same city uh, or town uh, uh, where there's a Thomas Hobbes Museum. Uh, Hobbes, whose work were uh, in 1680-something burnt in the city of Oxford has been too provocative. Uh, so uh, this is all great, so diversity. But that leads to a fourth thing, because you can't encourage diversity by just individual initiatives and responding to the day-to-day. -day. You have to take a perspective, which I call um, the perspective of stewardship. This is a, a landscape that I love. I've used the landscape metaphor before in dialogue with all of you. This is one of my favorite places in the world. It's a beautiful natural landscape. It's just above Esthwaite Water in the Lake District, looking at the Langdale Pikes. And you look at that and you think that is perfect natural beauty. But actually, that tarn that you're looking at was created in the 1890s. You can just see the dam at the far end. Uh, it was built in the 1890s. It was the first water that provided hydroelectricity in the Lake District. The island that you see in the middle was created by man. The wood on the right was planted in 1918. What I'm saying is stewardship involves managing a landscape. It doesn't involve governing it, dictating to it, dominating it. It involves creating the circumstances in which beauty and innovation occurs. That's the kind of stewards we want to be with all of you of the higher education landscape. Um, You've heard me use this phrase before. You can mandate adequacy and minimum standards. You can't mandate greatness. You have to unleash it. We want to create the circumstances in which all of you create greatness. Then there's the perspective of the economy. There's, you can't read a paper these days or a magazine without hearing something about um, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, or something else that's going to transform the work of the future. 
Nobody really knows how that's going to play out, although there's some great reports uh, explaining how that might work. So natural landscapes or not, we have to try, all of us, to anticipate that economy, that society of the future, because the students currently in university will, of course, live their lives uh, both in work uh, and um, in, in uh, communities in that economy that's coming. So understanding what it means to be employable, building that into programs, which I know many universities are doing a, a great job of, is fundamentally important to this. What students tell us again and again is they want high quality teaching, they want a good academic experience, they want a good degree that holds its value, and they want to be employable. We have to increasingly try to understand what that looks like. And you'll hear from Katja Hall, our board member, and others later in the morning, uh, trying to anticipate some of that. And then I bring the perspective of uh, Anna Akhmatova, the Russian poet. This is a painting by Nathan Altman, a cubist, a contemporary of hers, uh, done in the late, uh, early 1920s. Um, why is she here? Because we, I want to remember the arts in all of this. We can do what we like to anticipate the future of the employability, science, innovation, research, all fundamentally important parts of the university sector. But the position of the arts doesn't get less important as those developments happen. In some ways, it gets more important. Take, for example, biomedicine and the ethics that underpin it, or big data and the ethics that underpin it. I could list a whole load of other things where the perspective that comes from, broadly speaking, the arts is fundamentally important to interpreting how the world uh, might or should develop. Uh, and so universities can bring the historical perspective, a design perspective, an inspiration perspective, mastery of the language. Look at, for example, how um, Helen MacDonald, uh, who wrote H's for Hawke, or Robert McFarlane are reinterpreting the natural world for the 21st century. These are remarkable contributions from within universities that change the way we think about the world. So the performing arts, uh, culture, ethics, deep understanding, all of these things are fundamental to the 21st century. We will want to encourage them. Which brings me to my final perspective, uh, which is one of uh, Anna Akhmatova's greatest poems in Russian. It's called Mujestva. She, in 1942, she was in exile. Stalin, who had suppressed her, killed one of her husbands, imprisoned her son, called her back to Moscow because he realized that he needed a patriot to inspire people when Russia was under enormous challenge. And she wrote this incredible poem in 1942. She gave a performance of it in, live in Moscow. She hadn't been allowed to perform for 15 years. Um, she got a standing ovation. And Stalin's only comment on the standing ovation was, who organized it? He couldn't imagine a spontaneous standing ovation. But I put this poem up for a handful of reasons. One is, I wanted to put a poem up because poetry is important, interpretation of poetry is important. That whole strand of what work that universities do is as important as all the other subjects. Secondly, there's a real powerful advocacy in very adverse circumstances of free speech in here. We will preserve you Russian speech etc., etc., and we'll pass it on to our sons and heirs free and clean. So even in those circumstances, she knows the importance of free speech. And then she adds, which is my third reason, this is about cascading culture. The Russian speech, the Russian word, the language of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, uh, and all those great writers needs to be passed on even when the Nazis are at the gates of Moscow. And then finally, of course, not quite the same circumstances uh, as she was in, but the idea of courage, of thinking about the future boldly, confidently. I think we need to do that when we think about the university sector, which leads to my final perspective, which is the perspective of uphill struggle and sheer bloody-mindedness. Uh, these are demanding times, and not just for our country, not just for our sector, but for everybody all around the world. It's a very difficult transitional period with huge opportunities, but huge risks. Uh, and we all know that success, whether you're a student working your way through an undergraduate program or a postgraduate program, whether you're running a university, 
lecturing uh, on a particular subject or indeed trying to create a new regulatory framework, no success comes without sheer hard work, challenges and surmounting uh, hills like this uh, in Snowdonia. Nobody ever said this was going to be easy for any, any of us. But here's my last thought for you. If we can create the conditions in which the best educated generation of school students in English history, which is what we've got coming into universities, combine with a globally admired higher education system, which we've got through a regulatory framework that is judiciously designed to make that combination work. We should have a fantastic future ahead of us, an amazing future ahead of us, which is why I keep saying golden ages don't have to be in the past. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention.